Unity's UI can be a bit confusing for beginners, and many just end up clicking some buttons and hope for the best. I did that too when I started, and it didn't go so well. But like many things, you just have to take it slow and understand the fundamentals, and then you can build on top of it step by step. So that's what I'm gonna do in this video. I'll start really slow so you understand the concepts behind it. I'll talk about what a canvas is and does, render modes, anchors, vector transforms and more. In the end, I'll show you some tips and tricks to get even further, but please don't just skip to the end, because then you'll just end up playing the guessing game again. If you watch the whole video, you'll be able to understand them fully and be able to come up with your own solutions to create an awesome UI that behaves exactly the way you want it to. So let's get started. Every UI element is a game object that exists in your 3D scene. The only difference is that they use a VEC transform, where a normal game object, like this cube, use a transform component to define its position, rotation and scale. The UI elements have this VEC transform that also define their position, rotation and scale. And as you can see, there's also a bit more going on that is mostly related to how they behave to their parent, but we'll get to that later. Let's stay on the big picture. For UI elements, like images or text to function properly, they need to be parented to a canvas. The canvas is basically just a rec transform that has this canvas component. It doesn't matter how far they go down the chain, all that matters is that somewhere up there there is a canvas component. Or to see the other way around, a canvas is going to go through all of its children and make sure that they get rendered. A canvas is so important for UI elements that Unity will actually create one. If you create a new UI element and there is no canvas in the scene yet. So if I get here UI, let's go for Text Mesh Pro. And as you can see, Unity created this canvas parent, right? The canvas component. Also added canvas scalar. We'll get to that in a moment. But the important thing is for now, we need to have a canvas. The canvas component does several things at once. It reads the screen size and applies it to the rec transform. It also locks it for editing because it's the one in charge now to define the width and the height. It simply sets the rec transform to be one unit, one unit unit that is, for every pixel we have on the screen. This is a 4K monitor, so this is the width and height in pixels. Note that all that is changing is the width and the height. The scale is not changing at all because I disabled the canvas scaler for now. And the position that you see here, that simply refers to the pivot point, which changes a little bit when we drag this around. Apart from resizing, the canvas also determines how we get the pixels onto the screen and for that we have three different vendor modes. The default is screen space overlay and that simply means all the UI elements that are children of this canvas are going to get rendered in front of everything we have in the game world. You can actually see the game world is right here and it's quite small and right now our canvas is still based on one unit unit for every pixel but it doesn't matter because that vendor mode is just going to put this on top of everything in our game world. That is usually what you want because you don't want to have your UI behind things. But there are some drawbacks. So for one, you can't use custom shaders for the UI elements. You also can't use particle effects that you would put on top of the UI. And you might also notice, so post-processing isn't really working for the UI element. It looks like it might because in the scene view, Unity is going to apply the post-processing to everything. But here you can see it's not really grabbing the, the tone mapping, right? So if I disable that, uh, now everything looks pretty much the same. If I turn on post-processing, the game objects, background, they receive the post-process, but UI elements, they do not. So if you want your UI to be extra juicy, then the next render mode might be for you, is screen space camera. So what happens now is Unity scales the canvas down so it perfectly fits into the frustum of the camera. And as you can see, when the elements are in front of the camera, then they are going to get rendered in front of it. Now of course you can change the plane distance here and if we move this back, back, back a little bit, now the UI is on top again. For 2D elements, 
it's basically the same that you would use for well other sprites so the hierarchy for what gets rendered in front is the sorting layer followed by the order in layer and lastly the position in the hierarchy so you might notice the UI elements themselves they don't even have any kind of sorting layer or even sorting order they simply inherit it from the canvas since they now all have the same what determines their position is whatever is in front so when I go in here and I grab the purple image, when this is on the bottom, it means it gets rendered on top. If I move this to the top, it now gets rendered behind. And then of course you can freely mix and match your 2D sprites with the UI canvas. That is very useful, for example, for particle effects, which are usually just sprites where you can set the sorting layer and sorting order. And you might also notice post-processing is now actually applying it to the UI elements. So that can be very useful if you want some special effects. And then lastly, there's also the world space render mode. As you can see, now we can edit this again because now it is completely independent of the camera or the screen and we can just define it. And this is super useful when you want to have your UI tied to a game object. So for example, let's see, I have this cube here, right? I gave it its own canvas and I set the canvas to world space. And also notice I scaled the canvas down a lot. And that might seem a bit strange at first, but I've seen it in official Unity tutorials. Because the thing is, if you keep the scale at one and you just uh, set the width and the height to something reasonable like one unit or like two units, the problem is then these text elements you would have a font size of like 0.01. So if you want to have like reasonable font sizes here, it's just a lot easier to scale the canvas down to, you know, a lot. And this is also super useful for virtual reality because you don't want to attach your, your UI elements to the camera, which will then just be floating around for the player and it just feels super weird. And then other things like maybe you have an actual computer like in the game that has a screen or you might have uh, billboards or like this New York Stock Exchange ticker that runs across the building. Basically anything that is really tied to a game object and that can really spice up your game. Alright, I hope you're still fresh because now it's time for the boss battle and that is designing a UI that can adjust to all sorts of aspect ratios without falling apart like buttons overlapping or appearing off screen or weird stretching. As we've seen earlier, the, by default the canvas simply adjusts the size of the rec transform to the screen. But that is not the same as scaling because as you can see the, the actual UI elements that are parented to the canvas, their size doesn't change at all. But what we really want is scaling because, let's see, whoops, screen space overlay. Right, if I do this, there's no scaling. But we want that because scaling, just like a normal game object, means all the children are going to get scaled with it. And that brings us to the canvas scaler component that Unity will also automatically add to a canvas when it creates one for you. The first mode, constant pixel size, I have to be honest, I have no idea why anyone would ever use that. So it means if someone has like twice the resolution on their display, then everything will be half the physical size. And there might be use case, I tried to Google it, please enlighten me, I'm, I'm generally curious why this would make sense. But pretty much what everyone uses is scale with screen size. That is the one you want because that means it can adapt to different screens and still look pretty good. So it's asking us for a reference resolution and then there's different screen match modes, right? So please don't get confused and there are quite a lot of uh, possible combinations in total. But to be honest, it doesn't matter as much as the next thing, the anchors. But still, if you if you can play around with this and understand what's going on, then ultimately you're gonna find the perfect solution for your UI. So let's just go through a few scenarios here, right? Uh, I'm gonna say match the width. I set the screen match mode to width or height. And then I set this one to width, all the way to width. Now what happens, is it's going to take my reference resolution of 800, the width, and it's going to set the width. And then, it's simply going to adjust the height 
and the scale down here to make sure that the width is always going to be 800. All right, so if I drag this out, you can see it's always going to get back to it. it changes the scale. Of course, it has to change the height because I'm changing the aspect ratio. And if I'm changing the height, nothing's really going to happen because, well, it can just keep the width at 800. It just has to make it a higher or lower. And then, of course, when I do the same with the height, let's go here, 450. Now, the height is always going to be 450, and it's going to change the scale and the width to make sure that fits. So, if I change the width, then that's going to change. If I do the height, it's going to change the scale. And this pretty much depends on your UI and your type of game and how you want it to behave. Uh, what happens, what usually works best is just uh, some some common middle ground here, right? Because now it's going to take the best of both worlds, 0 0.5, so it's going to adjust both. It's going to adjust the width and height, depending on your ratio, but it's also going to adjust the scale. And then we also have expand. And now what it does it simply means, okay, expand. So it's it's never going to be low. It, the width should never be below 800 and the height should never be below 450. And it simply does that by scaling. So you can see no matter what I do here, I, I can get the width below 800 because then the scaling is going to kick in. And here the same if I squash it down, 150 weight, it's just going to make the scale go much lower. And then very similarly, we can also shrink this. And now it's never going to go above 800 with the width or never going to go above 450 for the height. And we can scale this one in here. And you can see it's already starting to, to behave much better right there if we have a different screen then it can scale it down and so on but you can also see it's not 100 percent useful yet right there is one element missing to really control how everything behaves and that is the most important part and unfortunately also the most misunderstood part of unity's ui that is anchors but however it's actually pretty easy once you you get the hang of it and then you can really control your ui uh, first of all, let's get this thing out of the way. I have to be honest, in the beginning that confused me. I thought you have to do something here, but in reality, you don't. There's nothing you can do here that you can't just do by setting these values directly. And I would actually encourage you in the beginning to do that because this is just encouraging to play the guessing game. Once you know what you're actually doing, then this is just going to save you some time because it's just common presets that you might use quite often. And you can really adjust your UI super quickly. It, it, it is very useful, but really don't just guess around. First, understand all of these values here, then you can use that. Okay, the anchors. So every rec transform has these anchors that you can see here in the scene. You can either change the values of them directly, or you can also just grab them and drag them around. So what are anchors? Anchors define the relationship between a rec transform's corners and its parent's rec transform corners. So I have this gray image here that is parented to the canvas. The canvas has these corners. This one has corners because well, it's a rec transform. It has four corners. So one thing that makes things a lot more easy is that every anchor is only responsible for one corner of its own rec transform and the corner of its parent rec transform. So this is only responsible for this corner and this one. Now the position of the anchor is always going to be defined by the parent, right? So I have this gray image here, this panel that is parented to the canvas. The canvas is responsible for saying where the anchors are going to be in 3D world space. And then the anchors define where the corners of this thing are. And the position of the anchor is always going to be relative, which is why when we go in here, image gray for the anchors, if I set it to zero, it's going to go, it means zero means the furthest left of its parent. And of course, if I set it to one, 
then it means the furthest uh, right. Yes, like this. So I made this image here that is always going to be at the position of the anchor. And let's only deal with one anchor because they all work exactly the same. As mentioned before, the position of the anchor is always going to be relative. And this is why when you start dragging this anchor around, you see these percentages, right? So if I put this in here, it says, I want this to be at 26% of the width of its parent. And it's always going to be that. So when I now start dragging this around, you can see the width is going to change. The scale might change, but the position is always going to be at 26% of the width. And of course the height, but I only did the width here because as you can tell, this would get a little bit uh, crowded here. All right, so I can drag this around. And of course, if I drag this up, the scale is even going to change and the width but it's at 26% of the width. And of course the height is the same. You can also check in here because this min, that is, this is a percentage, which is why you can only go from zero to one. So I have it at 25 or 255, which is 26%. And then the height is of course, it's always going to be the same. Right here at max, so that means it's at 84%. You might also be wondering, wait, I have four anchors and why do I only have four values when every anchor has an X and Y position? And the reason is they always on the same, they share some values, right? So the top anchor, the top anchors are always going to be on the same height, right? If I move this anchor, then this one is moving as well. Of course, if I move this one up and down, I'm moving the other one. And then the top and bottom anchor, they are always going to be on the same X and they're also going to share the same X. But it's VEC transform, so they don't need to be um, completely independent. And that means since they're all sharing some values, we only need four values for the X and Y position of four individual anchors. And now comes the actually really interesting part and it's kind of an, a genius solution, I have to say. It's always it's it's so simple but always amazing who came up with that in the in the first place and that is now that we know where the anchor is going to be and it's going to be relative to the parent we take that position and we position the corner of the rect transform in question here and that is always going to be an absolute value it does take the scale into account right so if the scale of the canvas is twice as big then that, that difference between the anchor and this one is also being twice as big. So here I made a line vendor that shows the uh, width, right? So right now it's 44.7 and we have to divide it by the scale. And you can see now, whatever happens, it's always going to be at 45. I'm just dividing by the scale because of course it does take that into account. Otherwise, we'd have the same with the constant pixel size, where suddenly people have twice the resolution, uh, everything is uh, twice as small. But we take the scale into account, and after that, it's it's absolute. And that means we have a lot of control over how this is going to work. So there's some super common um, cases. One is, of course, if we move I managed to click the anchor. If I move it right here, now the distance between the anchor and the corner is zero. So that means it's going to stretch, right? And I can do the same for the other ones here. Well, if the position in absolute terms is always going to be zero of the corner in relation to the anchor, then it's just going to stretch with the anchors. And that is what is happening, right? It is stretching. The anchor still says, yeah, I'm going to be at 26%. And here the height, in this case, it is uh, 62 or 63%. So it's just going to scale with it and it's going to stretch with it. And yeah, maybe now let's, let's risk a little um, using these, right? So another common one is if you place all of them in the middle, now there won't be any stretching because those 
are always going to be in the middle and the absolute position of this corner to this anchor is the same and of this anchor to this corner is also going to be the same in absolute terms and the anchors are going to be in the same place that means the distance between this and this is always going to be the same in absolute terms and that means there won't be any stretching. All we get is some nice scaling and it's of course always going to be in the middle. Now a common use case we do for say for example for, for panels, right? we have, let's bring this image purple back. What we often do is when we say, okay, I want this to be here. Notice the, oh, it's not parent. Let's parent, no, it's parent to do the image gray. So a common use case, we say, we, we kind of want this to be in the corner, but we don't want this to be exactly in the corner. But you know, there should be a little bit of an offset. So we just place it in here and then we make sure that the anchors are in the corner. So all I do is click here. And this is what I meant. Once you know what you're doing, then this is really helpful because now it placed the anchors here in the corner of its parent. And so when we scale this, right, this is not getting scaled. Let's put this to stretching, right? Let's say, for example, let's stretch in the top and left. So I place the anchors in this corner and in those corners. So there won't be any stretching in the width because as you can see, the width is still going to be the same, right? Same distance to this one, same distance to this one, anchor is going to be in the same X. So the X is going to stay the same, but they are spread apart. So by keeping that distance absolute and that distance absolute, that means there will be stretching and let's see if we go up and down. There's a bit of stretching going on. Not when we go here, but of course when we go up and down and now you can definitely see it. But since we positioned this one and we said in absolute terms, we always want this to be uh, related to this and always make sure this these anchors, they're all at zero. They always stay in the corner, so we have full control over this. And that is pretty much the gist of it. Like once you grasp that concept and then you start playing around with it, the, the canvas becomes super, super easy. And of course you can take full control of it. You can even go further and you say, you know what? I want to have some scaling first, some stretching. When I reach a different ratio, I want to flip that and you can do that because everything you see here, you can access and modify in the scripts. And it's pretty much as simple as getting like a uh, rec transform dot rotation, rec transform dot local scale, rec transform dot uh, anchor min and all of this. So for example, for this line render right, I can get the position of this corner. I can get the, the position of this. And of course, I'm also placing the anchor image with this script and then I get all these values to do these calculations and yeah I'll upload the project to github if you want to take a look I'd actually encourage you if you want to get good at UI just like take control of it with uh, scripting and then you see like oh this is how it behaves oh as mentioned there should be some tips because hey you watched all the way to the end so the first tip is use multiple canvases um, this is kind of known that every time you change any of these elements that are part of a canvas, like you just change the text by one letter, that means every single thing on this canvas needs to be redrawn. So it makes sense to use multiple canvases and group them based on how often they get updated. Uh, of course, having like one canvas for every single element might be quite impractical to work with. And I gotta be honest, I never did profiling on a game and then realized, ah, it's that UI element getting drawn. That's the performance bottleneck. It's usually something else. So I won't go overboard with it, but it's, it's just something to keep in mind, you know? Also something that is quite common and quite useful is you can use uh, slicing. This is also why I prefer to use images for UI, because you could use a sprite, but see, this is set to slice. So let me change the color real quick. Maybe if I use uh, this one, right? You can see I have these corners here and a little bit of highlight and a little bit of shadow here. So if I were to set this to 
it is set to simple. <laughs> and let's go stretching all the way. Maybe a little trick question. If I stretch all the way, where would I have to place the anchors? Well, I place them on the corners. And then if I want maximum stretching, then I get the pivots pretty close. If I want 100% stretching, yeah, I would get them all the way there, but then that's uh, not going to be that interesting to look at. Anyhow, now we have some stretching going on. And this is probably not what we want, especially if we have a bit more sophisticated like graphical elements. What we usually want is we want to keep this intact, right? And this is where the slice comes in. And oh yeah, this is a nice example. It says <coughs> this image doesn't have a border. So I click this one and I click the actual sprite. I go into the sprite editor. And now it's asking me to define a border. And all I have to do is drag these green points here in the middle. Maybe just a little bit like this, like this, like this, and like uh, maybe a bit higher. Maybe this one a bit lower. You can also set it here directly. Now what's happening is it's going to say, okay, like these corners, I'm going to keep them as they are. There won't be any stretching or squashing. But these middle parts, yeah, I'm going to uh, stretch and squash that. And all of this in the middle gets uh, squashed too, or stretched. So sometimes you might have a lot of things going on, but it, it makes sense when you design your eye elements, just have like this, this tiny stretch that you can say like, okay, you know what, this part can get stretched and it won't look weird. And then we just click apply, close this one, and you can see now it's keeping these corners intact and we can also define the scaling if i go down then it's gonna get a little bit bigger uh, if i go too low then it's actually going to squash these parts in which is probably not what we want but if i go a bit higher you can see okay now the corners are intact again and if i scale this right it's looking quite decent and you can even go uh tiled um, well, now we're tiling that part, which of course doesn't really make a lot of sense, but you might have some repeating elements and then you just place the corners. So exactly this one element can get repeated and then you can even get this tiled thing. So very simple and, you know, sliced. It makes your UI look, but it makes it look a lot less squashed and stretched because then it just looks like you were lazy and it, it just kind of breaks the immersion. All right, so I really hope this video helped to, to get you a bit of a more fundamental understanding of it and, well, less guessing and more just actually knowing what to do. And of course, with everything in Unity, it's just don't expect to just read through the information once and now you're like a Jedi, just practice. Like, um, come back to this video, maybe read the official documentation once in a while, just play around with it and before you know it, you're going to design your UI and it's just going to fit on every screen and you're going to wonder how was this ever confusing. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching and of course subscribing to this channel, liking this video, that helps a lot. And yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. I can definitely do a follow up. The UI is quite complex and I really like to, to get in here and do the scripting, right? Oh yeah, as I mentioned, I'm going to upload the GitHub. It's, it's pretty simple, but you can just take a look and you know, see how this is done. Okay, thanks for watching and goodbye.